The David Cassidy Connections with Louise Poynton. Hello and welcome to the David Cassidy Connections, your podcast all about David's legacy. Thank you for downloading this podcast wherever you are listening on your preferred streaming platform. And remember to click that subscribe button so you will be the first to know when new episodes are released. I am your host, Louise Poynton. And first, I would like to thank everyone for your wonderful messages on social media about my previous guest, Ryan Roxy. He proved to be very popular with so many of you. And the collective download figures for the David Cassidy Connections podcast have now been pushed through the 100,000 barrier. So thank you for being here. This week, my special guest is talking to me about his amazing life journey, which took him from being a songwriter for the Partridge family to discovering, producing and managing Bruce Springsteen. Mike Appel always wanted to be a songwriter and musician, starting his career in the Brill Building, which was the heartbeat of the music industry in New York. Born in Flushing, Queens, he was a member of groups in the 1950s and 1960s, including The Balloon Farm, co-writing their 1967 hit, A Question of Temperature. Mike worked with songwriting duos, including Lieber and Stoller and Hugo and Luigi. With his writing partner, Jim Kretikos, five songs they penned together were recorded by the Partridge family. The Million Seller, Doesn't Somebody Want to Be Wanted, along with I Can Feel Your Heartbeat, Somebody Wants to Love You, Rainmaker, and Umbrella Man. Mike then went on to discover and manage Bruce Springsteen. He produced his first two albums and co-produced Springsteen's third and breakthrough album, Born to Run. In our conversation, Mike talks about the skills he has learned from other songwriters, his own writing technique, the first meeting of songwriters gathered at the pilot showing of the Partridge family, and the legacy of that music, and he also explains how he would have managed David Cassidy. He is currently working on a Broadway musical, Stage Door Johnny, and his autobiography. Here is my conversation with Mike Appel. Ah, oh, it's lovely to see you. Likewise. Very nice portrait behind you. There's my mum. Wow. She was a great singer during the war. She sold, sung a lead with the Walter Wanger Orchestra, um, in uh, Manchester, New Hampshire during the war, the last few years of the war. And Walter went on to produce uh, Liz Taylor with, in Cleopatra. He was actually the producer of that movie. But he was the band leader that she was the lead singer of. I can tout myself for knowing, you know, being a bit of an archivist and, and, and knowing riffs and all that kind of stuff from my era. Unlike my mother, I can't sing things like she could sing. She could sing, <laughs> speaking of London, Foggy Day in London Town. Mm. Now, Frank Sinatra s- sings that song. That song is very odd. That's not song, song, blue, da, 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 da. It's not like that. It's like offbeat. It's like, what's it all about, Alfie? It's like the best of Burt Backer when he's trying to be obscure. I went back and listened to that record, and I said, not only do I not like this record, it's not like Summer Wind and some of Frank's fifth. So I have, I have my favorite Frank Sinatra song, and it, it just doesn't happen to be Foggy Day in London Town. But my mother could sing that cold Teddy Wilson trio. And they, I mean, Teddy Wilson used to play with um, Louis Armstrong, and Benny Goodman, all those people. Uh, my mother would go out there and sing in a foggy day in London town with the Teddy Wilson trio. Not a soul in that room can sing that song in a packed house. She'd just get up and sing with them. She sang with the Larry Clinton Orchestra, she, the Dipsy Doodle, that song, and My Reverie. Those were like pop hits of the, uh, you know, the, the hit parade, you know? She had an ear that I did not have. So my mother was the real thing. My mother could have been Dinah Shore, actually. She actually started in the same building that I started, the same building that I found my wife in, uh, the Brill <laughs> Building, the famous the famous Brill Building. And I found my wife on the blackout, the night of the blackout. So it was a, and, and, and you know, that building has a lot of memories for, for, for all of us. Yeah, uh, but yeah. my mother has, you know, departed uh, some years now. She, uh, I got breast cancer and uh, and then finally got lung cancer. She oh, beat the breast wow. cancer. So terrible, terrible. She was the, the light of our family's life. She was uh, very witty and very funny and um, very good, uh, had a very good spirit and never got down and 
And uh, she, me, my father was, the, you know, she was the perfect person for my father because he was everything but that. She, she studied with Ticker Freeman in, uh, in the Brill Building for years. And it was only uh, towards the end of her life that my father and I were just driving down Broadway and he had my dementia. He says, oh, geez, he says, you know, you, I used to take your mother here to all her uh, singing lessons. I said, really? You mean the Brill Building? He says, yeah, 1619, right? I said, yeah, that's it. I said, well, that's where I started. He said, is that a fact? Can you imagine this? His own son, he doesn't even know where I started or anything like that. He tells me that my mother started here and, and, and also my mother wanted to have more children and she wanted to have a big family. So she opted out of, you know, the Dinah Shore Show, the Chevy Hour, the Dinah Shore Chevy Hour on NBC TV, which lasted there for seven years. She threw in the hat on becoming a, a superstar like Dinah Shaw was and lived out, lived out her life uh, and died at uh, 47 years of age, you know, and it was, it, was, it was a big, terrible loss for all of us. It was a, my, my father, he needed her more. This proved to him once and for all that he needed her a lot more than he thought he did. I think, you know, it's like uh, that, uh, what's that song of Ra Ralph Donna's? You don't know what you've got until you lose it. And that's what my father went through when he lost my mother. Well, we all did in, 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 in our own ways, but, but, you know, hey man, she was, she was a, a crutch for him. She was his rock. And uh, it was a very sad, sad day for him and, and for all of us when she, when she left. And it's always like, it's a, I always say, you know, why did, why did she leave so early? Why did she have, why did the good guy have to leave early? And all the, you know, the turkeys are left behind, you know? I said, I said well, maybe they need more time than she did. Um, but, you know, people come into this world uh, with a absolute end date in mind. They are not flaky about it at all. They know exactly what they're doing and when they leave and why they're going to leave. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, there is no excuse for it. It just is the way it is. Mm. And so I, I've, I've, I've come to grips with it in, in, in that regard and in that way. But we, in, when, when you live in Old Brookville, you don't live. There's no corner where you hang out with anybody. It's, it's, it's horse country. It's wealthy people's country. My father did very well in, in, in real estate. And that's why we live there, to be, to be with the wealthy people. And we, we belong to, if you can believe this, I had access to, to playing golf on seven golf courses, six of them private ones, one of them a public one, where my St. John's golf team played. Uh, I used to caddy at, at, at several of them, and others were clubs that my father belonged to two clubs. My father's partner belonged to two clubs. So I ended up being a real, a real good golfer. But I'm so good that my father wanted to put me on tour with one of the professional golfers back in the day. Yeah, oh yeah, I was that good. And, uh, and I said to him, ah, I don't know. I don't know if I really want to go and do this. I said, you know, I mean, it's no big deal playing good golf. And it wasn't to me to playing good golf because I had, not, not only did I pick it up at, at the age of 13, but I also, because I played at society clubs, you know, like uh, Meadowbrook and Piping Rock, those people took up the game, not at 13, like I did. They took it up at five. So these guys, those guys all had great swings because they were playing it from childhood. My kid even took it up at five and he became a pretty good golfer. And I told my father, I want to be a writer and I want to play music. He said, and I quote, why would you want to do that and live on the margin of society? And I said, well, how do you know I'm going to live on the margin of society? He says, oh, stop it. He says, there's not a, a guitar player. What guitar player has money? What writer of lyrics has money? I mean, come on, what are you talking about? I mean, uh, Frank Sinatra, well, maybe something like that. Is that what you think with this rock stuff or whatever the hell it is you call it, that hillbilly you know, junk you play? <laughs> so I said, yeah, that's it. So it wasn't within, it was within, I don't know, maybe a couple of years that I already had the hits with the Partridge family. So the Partridge family got me even with my father. I said, hey, dad, guess who wrote the hit record? Blah, 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 blah. And it's going to be on tonight. You can watch it. Are you kidding me? Okay, so he sits there and he watches it and he waits for my, you know, my name to be, you know, listed on, on the, uh, the ending credits of the show. That was it. That was it. He, no more. And on top of everything, because I was a scratch golfer and he was anything but, 
but he couldn't play because he really, he didn't want to be a real estate broker. He wanted to be a golfer. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to do that all the, all the time. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be a musician. I wanted to write songs, produce songs, publish songs, and, and, and be in that fun business. And he, he couldn't see that for the light until I was on the cover, not the cover, but the, the, the TV set with uh, my first million seller. And that was doesn't somebody want to be wanted. And that was a big, 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 big hit. I remember him getting a gold record for it. And, and all that was like, you know, that's before Bruce, you know. So yes. that yeah. was that was yeah. that was terrific. I played in a little band called the Humbugs. And uh, the uh, the manager of the, the, the Pipe and Rock Club came by. He saw me leaning on a, a, a bunch of golf bags. Um, and he said, you play golf? I said, yes, I do, sir. But I also play in a band, a rock band. He said, you do. He said, do you have any demos? And that was the first time I ever heard somebody in, in the public use the word demo to refer to like an acetate of a, of a de demonstration record, not the actual record that it's going to be when it's on Columbia Records. I heard, never heard anybody use that term, except people in the Brill building, people in 1650, 1697. And then uh, he said, when you get it together, bring, bring them by and drop them off my office and I'll get back to you. So we exchange numbers. <clears throat> I call him, told him I'm ready. I got the stuff. He goes, I drop him off. He calls me into for a meeting. I sit down and I say, hey, how'd you like the songs? He said, oh, the songs, they were horrid little records. I said, they were horrid little records. I said, well, that takes care of that, doesn't it? He says, no, it doesn't take care of that. I'm going to be a hero to all the parents in the, in the club, the Piping Rock Club. They'll have me here as the manager forever because of you and your little band. He says, that's right. You and that band of yours are going to be the first rock band to ever play the Piping Rock Club. We wore white blazers. We had white dress shirts. We had scarlet red ties. We had scarlet red pants. We had white loafers. We had scarlet red socks. We played, you know, our rock music. And we, and we had summer tans too. We played sometime, you know, mid June, July, end of July. So we all had tans. So we, we were a good looking lot. And man, did we take them by surprise. Oh, the piping rock club rock that night. First time in its history. <laughs> I mean, it was just, you know, un unbelievable. It was really, really unbelievable. And uh, we played every coming out party by, you know, people, you know, they have that society people from the Hamptons to Nassau County and everybody's private parties and everybody's clubs, uh, you know, for four straight years. I left the, the, my, my childhood band and I played with, with some other bands for a very short period of time because I got called up by the army. The army had called me up for, for service in, the, in, the, in Vietnam. I just didn't want to try to get out of it like by lying. And my sister, thank God, Connie, she said, why don't you go uh, out to, to the Marine outfit in, in Huntington? I said, are you kidding? Who wants to go out of the, get out of the army and go into the Marines? I gotta be out of your mind. So she says, no, they have a reserve unit out there. They don't go away unless it's really terrible. She said, it's just, just you stay out there for, uh, uh, for, you go into Paris Island for six months and you do make monthly meetings and that's the end of it. I said, really? So I run out there and I, when I, well, I got out there and I said, hey, listen, the army has already got me. I'm in their system. I don't have a lot of time to, to, to dabble around here. We have to move on this as soon as possible. He said, as soon as I stamp your folder, USMC, you will never hear from them ever again. I guarantee it. Are you in with me or not? And I said, I'm in. He says, okay, private, you'll never hear from them again. Sure enough, I never heard from them, or the, 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 the army, and I did hear from them. And that has got to be one of the great experiences uh, of my entire life, because you would wonder why a little wuss like me, uh, songwriter, producer, you know, in the entertainment business, I mean, it's not like I come from the construction business, you know. Uh, I come from this like delicate world of songwriting, you know. Yeah, did I not read somewhere that your mother bought you your first single? She, oh, yeah, yeah, she bought me my first three singles, as a matter of fact, yeah. Which were? She bought me Chuck Berry's uh, Roll Over Beethoven, uh, uh, Jody Reynolds' Endless Sleep, but a very moody song. And, uh, and very cool song, very different kind of song. There's never been another one quite like 
Endless Sleep. And and the other, the, the third song uh, was uh, Blue Suede Shoes, uh, Carl Perkins. And she bought me my first guitar. It was a terrible, terrible guitar. It was a, an acoustic and you couldn't play it because you couldn't get enough pressure on the strings so that the strings actually touched the fretboard so you could actually make a note. So it was, it was just the most, you know, suffocating experience. And then going to, uh, to, to teachers who were te trying to teach me how to play, you know, Buffalo Gals, won't you come out tonight? And I'm looking, to, and I'm looking to play 40 years of, for 40, 40 miles of bad road by Dwayne Eddy, you know? So the, 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 the space between where I was and where I wanted to go was enormous and endless. <laughs> The endless sleep became the endless it, journey. Yeah, the endless journey. It's been a long journey, I tell you. And, and and it's still not over. I can't believe the things that are going on in my life right now. It's like a second coming, you know, it's like, what? I mean, it's not that I haven't been working at them for decades. In the case of the musical, uh, Stage Door Johnny, uh, that thing. I, 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 I really didn't realize that Broadway plays, Broadway musicals especially, are... Uh, so encompassing, so, uh, um, you know, uh, such a, an amount of, of, of dedication has to be devoted to them because not only do you have to write all the songs, and in my case, I wrote all the songs, words and music. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I, I had to write this, the script, what they call the book on Broadway. And I did that too, but I had to learn that craft. I didn't know that craft. I mean, just because you think of yourself as, as, a, as a lyricist uh, and, and, or, writer of music words and lyrics uh that doesn't make you a writer of stories and and and, and characters and their interactions between each other so it, it, it was a, a very 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 long uh learning experience for me that i'm still in the process of you know learning but uh if you look at my first drafts and you look at my recent drafts you'll realize that an awful lot has transpired <laughs> over these years but it's been it's been uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 years. Some of the songs are almost 20 years in the making. And uh, uh, some of the, in the, and the early scripts are, you know, at least 15, 17 years old too. So long, 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 long trip. And, uh, but I got a lot of uh, traction from a, a number of people. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a difference between, you know, classic rock people like myself and people that were involved with, big, big, giant, classic rock acts. Um, and and uh, the uh, Broadway crowd, so to speak. And and uh, they were very good to me. They, 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 they said, Mike, you're gonna have to work on that script. You're gonna have to work on that script. But I love all the music. So don't give up, don't give up. They were very, very courteous and very, very, you know, uh, helpful. And, uh, you know, they promoted, they, they promoted the idea rather than discouraged it. And boy, I needed it. <laughs> I needed it. You mentioned Broadway there, and I, I think it was David Foster who said, for a Broadway show, um, you don't have to write a hit song, but you do have to write a good song. Yeah, see, there's something that they, they, they always say on Broadway, that every song that's in the show has to push the dialogue forward in some manner, shape or form. And uh, Galt McDermott, the, the writer of Hair, the music to Hair, was a friend of mine, personal friend of mine, uh, living on Staten Island like me, now deceased. That was a loss. A great melody writer, great melody writer. You know, let the sunshine in. He's got a million of them. But the fact is, um, he always said to me, Mike, there's no sacred cows on Broadway. Do it your way. Do it the way you want to do it. And I decided to basically focus more on the songs being done first than the actual dialogue and all that. So I had to rewrite and change things around so that I could have hit songs. And, and, and it, the, the, the songs that I was writing weren't just good songs as David Forster pointed out and only helped the dialogue going forward. They had to be hit songs too. So I believe I got about three or four hit songs in the show, uh, as well as all of them carrying the dialogue forward anyway. So, but that's what took the, 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 the enormous amount of time. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. And we'll obviously talk about the Partridge family music. Sure. Could I start with Bruce Springsteen? Because he once described you as his musical brother in arms. 
I know you always believed in him and he acknowledged that, but what did you see in him that other people didn't at that point when well, you first discovered him? I was the first person that he went to uh, with the, his new songs that bore no resemblance to his previous songs. And uh, uh, when he first went to me, that was really the second time. What you're talking about is really the second time. Okay. The first time okay. he was he was ill prepared. He had only two songs to play me. They were nothing to write mother about. And uh, uh, I said to him, I said, you know, after listening to the two songs, I said, you know, you're going to have to write more songs. And he says, oh no, I can do that. I said, well, well you're going to have to. You know, if you want an album deal, which I presume you do. And he said, yes, I do. I said, well, you got to write more songs. He says, well, I'm going to be going back to San Mateo, where my parents are living in California. And when I come back to the states, uh, I'll have all the songs ready. And so I said, well, okay, that's fine with me. And uh, he uh, uh, left the left the offices. And uh, when he called, and that was in November of '71. Then in February 72, you know, months later, he calls up the West Farrell organization, <laughs> which is your, you know, the home of your David Cassidy and your Partridge family. <laughs> oh, yeah. Remember, that is where he went, first saw me in, the, in West Farrell's office, okay? And now the second time, he calls the, the secretary, the secretary, and he asked for me, and I say, I don't know any Bruce Springsteen because I've totally forgotten him, okay? And he keeps badgering her to, to, to get me to pick up the phone. I said, listen, wouldn't I you know, pick up the phone if I knew Bruce Springsteen? I'm not trying to be difficult. I don't know any Bruce Springsteen. Then he says, I'm the guy that Tinker called you about. And Tinker was his first quasi manager, sound man, whatever you, whatever you want to call that. And Tinker knew me from another act that Tinker had that I loved. To make a long story short, I said, oh, that guy. And I picked up the phone. He said he had the songs. I said, hey, can you come up today? He said, yep, I can come up today. All right. I said, anytime after five o'clock. So he comes up after five o'clock, comes in the door, opens his uh, uh, guitar case, plays the first song, and blows me right out the door. Uh, his lyrics, and I'm a, I'm a lyricist myself, and I consider myself a pretty damn good one. But boy, oh boy, not at that time. I wasn't as good as him. And he walked in that door there. Man, he was prepared. He was Bang, boom, bang, boom, bang. In fact, I asked him to play one of his songs over again. I said, so I, I make sure that you said what I thought you said. He, he did it again. He sung the, the lyrics again. And I said, oh, my God. You know, silver star studs on my duds, just like a Harley in heat. Like a Harley Davidson motorcycle, like in heat, like an animal is in heat. I said, man, you have like just given me chills. He's giving me chills right now, and as I'm I'm, I'm re reciting and remembering the the incident, and, and that's how we started off. So it was like, my God, I, you have any more like that? Oh yeah, I've got plenty of them. And he <laughs> he went through like I don't know eight songs, and one was better than the other. I have never been devastated like that uh, in my life, and. Uh, and I was very, very, very excited about a group called Sir Lord Baltimore that I had uh, got in touch with. And uh, they toured with Peter Frampton and, and, and Humble Pie and, and uh, you know, uh, Ozzy Osbourne, and Black Sabbath. Um, and, you know, they, they were, we, we had them uh, uh, right where we wanted them. It's just that the manager was a guy who really didn't understand our value to that group. Uh, Jim Credicus and I wrote all the lyrics to every single song. We rehearsed them until those wild Indians, as they were, coalesced into a, a, a unit that could play songs with structure, albeit loose structure. I loved the way those guys played. But Bruce Springsteen came into me. He, he was a personality. So I, it's, it's like why somebody says to me, "My, who do you think is the greatest were, uh, you know, artist in the world? I said, Bruce Springsteen. So oh, you're prejudiced. I said, well, of course I'm prejudiced, uh, but let's get past that. I was at my son's wedding and there was a, the lead singer of a tribute band, Tramps Like Us, who plays, well, brings Bruce Springsteen songs when they go out live. And they're the best tribute Springsteen band in the United States of America and have been for, you know, 30 years. Uh, their band played five songs in a row off Born to Run, the album. When a writer that had got me, to, after, after Springsteen and I split up, I stopped writing for a while. And the guy that got us back together, this guy by the name of Rob Martin, a good friend of mine to this very day. He said, you know, Mike, 
When I hear those five songs in a row like that from the Born to Run album, there is no better five songs in the world. The Beatles don't have five in a row like that that can be played quite like that. And remember, and 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 I and of course this is me now speaking to him. I said, remember, the Beatles are four guys, and if you want to count uh, Sir, Sir George Martin, which I would, um, there's five guys there writing the songs. So it's a composite. Bruce Springsteen's got the oneness. It's coming from one man's heart, one man's energy, one man's view on things, one man's take on the world. And that is the difference between the great Beatles, the superstar Beatles, my greatest, my, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan like you, you wouldn't believe of the Beatles. Um, I mean, they blow me away. So many things, so many techniques and so many tricks that they played over the year in recording tech. I mean, just the five of them. I mean, we all had to be on our best, you know, on our best manners around those guys because they just set the record. Here, here's the bar. Here's the bar, Mike. Here's where we are. Where are you? <laughs> and that's what they did to everybody. But they made all of us better too. All of us got much better because of them. And so they, we have them to thank for, for, for not only leading the way, showing the way, leading the way and, and demanding it. And in other words, if you want to, you know, go out and play live in, in the era of the Beatles, you damn well better be great. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> See, that's the problem with the Beatles. Mm. They're quality riff writers, they're quality melody writers, you know, and they can sing harmonies together like birds. I mean, they know their stuff. You know, they're not like, you know, you can't brush these fellas aside, okay? Yeah, these guys are going yeah. to be tough guys to wrangle with. Because you always, from the beginning, felt that Bruce had the potential to rival Dylan. You see, it's understandable why people in the beginning gave him the Dylan rap, you know, the Dylan cop, you know. However, Bruce Springsteen, as his, as his live performance attests to, is an emotional guy. He's got his mother's Italian um, blood in him. And when he's writing and singing and everything like that, serious, like, you know, he, he's singing from the heart. He, he has that thing from his mother. And that is the oneness and the emotion that I'm talking about, even though Dylan has the oneness too. He doesn't have the emotion. You know, I mean, he just doesn't. When Bruce sings, you know, Thunder Road acoustically, you get it. You realize, you know, when he's talking about, you know, your graduation gown lies in rags at their feet. I mean, he's like, it's like so touching. It's so um, emotionally, you know, the, he, he, touching. The, he, he, one can't get away with it. The Beatles really don't have that kind of thing going for them. I mean, there are songs that they sing that are more touching and more emotional than others, for sure. Okay. But, but, but Bruce is always the oneness. As I always tell anybody you know, when they start out, you, you, if, if you want to be in the, in the rock business, so to speak, if, if there is such a thing anymore, I said, well, you got to go, you got to start with Bruce Springsteen because he is the embodiment of high 500 lead singers. And, and God knows how many songs he sung in his life. He, he goes on tour with four or 500 in his satchel case that he can play in, in a heartbeat. And so can the E Street Band. There is no other band on earth that can do that back then and now. Now, you also asked me why, why he, he, I'm his brother in arms um, musically. It, it comes down to little, thi little things like this. He's playing uh, the, uh, an English band uh, uh, every time you walk in the room uh, and uh, the, 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 the searches. That great little guitar like they got in the song. Well, I played that guitar like when I was in a band. Bruce and, and Steve Van Zandt are on stage and they're teaching each other the song. And Steve keeps playing the wrong riff. I hear it, I'm at the sound console because I was doing the sound and lights for Bruce Springsteen as well as managing his career. Mm -hmm. So it drove me nuts. I finally walked down to the, to the stage. I said, hey, that riff is wrong. And so they both look at me like, hey, Mike, you know, are you kidding? You know, we're, we're who we are. <laughs> Where who we are? <laughs> I said, "Well, I'm going to sing it." Ding, 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 ding. See that note? That's a note you're not hitting. You're singing a note, one note le less than that, and that's why it's not working for me. Then he did it, and he said, "Oh, oh, okay." So I walked away. I didn't say, "See, I told you." I never do that. I just walk away. <laughs> yes. 
they know. And I could tell in a second if that te- piano was out of tune. And if it was out of tune, I get a hold of the promoter, get that guy, get a tuner here right this minute, blah, 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 blah. He knew that. And that's why he says, do you know who Michael Phelps, wow. my brother in arms, goes, and remember, I come from the heart of Tin Pan Alley and all the great songwriting teams from the Br- Brill Building, Lieber and Stolo, the guys that wrote all the Elvis Presley early hits. You know, they, they were there. I worked for them for a while. Uh, Hugo and Luigi, the guys that produced every Sam Cooke record, I worked for them too. You know, my, like I said, my wife worked up for, for, for uh, Southern Pier International. Hoagie Carmichael used to come and sit on her desk telling stories because he was a storyteller himself. When she told me that, I said, Hokey, come on. He was in movies with big people. That guy's a real guy. I mean, you know, George, you're on my mind, he wrote. Up the Lazy River, he wrote. I mean, that guy's the real deal. Things like, and then of course, she worked in the copyright department with Buddy Holly's wife. It's like, huh? And then to meet her in the New York City's first great blackout, mm. to be there recording a song, background vocals, and then the lights going out in the studio, meeting my wife for the first time. At, we had to crawl on our hands and knees because there was no windows. It, it, the, the studio was inside the building. And I led everybody out because I was used to the studio because I recorded there. You mentioned that you were working for Wes Farrell and that the first yep. time you met Bruce was when you were working for Wes Farrell's organization. That is correct. Yes, that is correct. I Go wondered ahead. if you ever offered Bruce to Wes Farrell. I did. He didn't see it. Okay. Wes okay. is a. A superhero to me in many ways. I mean, he wrote with he wrote Boys, the Beatles covered Boys. Uh, so that gets me with Luther Dixon. Uh, Wes wrote you know a song that I played in my band all my life, Hang On Sloopy. All right, he wrote that with Burt Burns. Okay, Wes is not some sort of guy. Uh, you just push him aside. Oh no 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 no. He also wrote with Boys and Heart, two of the guys that wrote monkey hits you know a lot a lot of hits throw, let's lock the door throw away the key and you know come a little bit closer from jay and the americans he wrote those two songs and, and west was in very very friendly with with a barry man of man and wild he wrote certain songs with the part with the, for the partridge family with barry man he, he was regarded as as a teen idol kind of you know and pop songwriter producer publisher at the time and Bruce Springsteen walks in and it's like what he just didn't see it I mean you know he, I, I could see why he didn't see it it's it's not a mystery to me or Bruce and and you don't I don't lose any respect for for Wes but Wes Farrell when the business changed to Bruce Springsteen and the Who and uh, the Rolling Stones Mick Jagger and Keith Richards and uh, the Moody Blues and Pink Floyd, uh, Deep Purple, all those great English acts. You know, I, mean, I mean, America had some, but I looked to England as, as my cue, not to America. But Wes Farrell lost what he loved. That business went away. When, when that all ended, and the television shows, the Archies and the, and the Monkeys and the, and, and, the, and the Partridge Family shows ended, the fun for Wes ended. With all the songwriters that you've worked with, what did you learn from them? The likes of Hugo and Luigi? Um... Well, you, you, well, you basically learned working with all of them is that, uh, Lieber and Stoll, all the guys, is that you learn the classic format. Like, you know, two verses and a chorus, two verses and a chorus, and then a bridge, or a middle eight, as the Beatles used to say. Right. And that's it. And, and that's basically it. And 90% of pop records and 95% of pop records all have that going for them or some variation of that very format. So that's what you learn for sure. And then you push the envelope, at least I have now in my life. I've pushed it way beyond all of my mentors and co-writers. My lyrics now have, have pushed me beyond, not beyond, I shouldn't say that. You still can have a pop hit record with a, a, a very challenging lyric let's say but uh, you can have you know 12 hits with with challenging lyrics it's just not going to happen you need time to come up with challenging lyrics um and they need to fit right especially in my in in a a musical so it's no easy task doing that 
I was amazed at some of the things. That, in fact, one of the most amazing things that ever happened to me, I have a song called Einstein's in Love. And this is in the musical. It's one of my best lyrics. And I thought I was done with the lyric. I figured I was finished with that song. Okay, Mike's got that one wrapped up. Oh, another great lyric, says Mike Appel. I wake up one morning and there was a, there's a line in my head that was better than the line I had in the song. I said, I better jot this down right away because I'll forget it like I've done before. I've paid that price. So I'm way too smart for that. So I immediately get up and write it down. And then I hit, then something hit me. I said, is it possible, Mike, that you not only made this line better, but that you could go back and make all the lines in this whole song? Let's say 25 to 35% better. Let's not say 100% better because that's ridiculous. You got some real good lines here. So I went back and literally rewrote maybe 75 to 85% of a new lyric on top of a lyric that I thought was good to go. But when I got through with it, it wasn't good to go. I was wrong. It could have been better. And there was a voice in my head somewhere pushing me along, giving me that thought. It went into my head all of a sudden. I wonder if, you know, one, one line could be better. Maybe 14, 15 or 20 lines could be better. So that's what I did. And I found that out. That's one thing I learned on my own. But a lot of times, you know, when you're writing with others, sometimes you're doing more of the lyric writing than the other guy is. He's doing some riff or something that, that he came up with that's going to be endemic to the, you know, to the goodness of the song. And when you're the Beatles, you don't always write the whole song. You know, somebody writes this, or I came up with a title. I'm good with that. And, and I'm good with lyrics. I'm okay with music. I'm not Burt Backrack. I'm not Paul McCartney. That is for sure. You know, when you're such a great lyricist, you tend to just rely on being able to verbalize everything that you think is cool and being able to do that uh, and constantly being able to do it and see what happens. See if, see if you don't charm the heck out of what's divine inside you just dying to write something tonight. And, and, and uh, that's happened to me time after time after time. And, and when, when I get stymied on lyrics sometimes, I don't know how or where the where the lyric came from because I'm very good with idiomatic expressions and you have to live a long time which I have to to know a lot of, uh, of idiomatic expressions and but you have to have you have to be charmed by them you know a stitch in uh, nine a stitch in time saves nine there's a little idiomatic expression you know <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, I, I I those things go in my mind but other other expressions lock themselves into my mind that I didn't know were there, that I didn't know I, I would be able to draw upon at some later date when maybe it first made its entrance into my head. Nowadays, I do it in a much more conscious way. Somebody will use a word that I haven't used in a while. I say, oh, that's a good word. I haven't used that word in a hell of a long time. Disingenuous. Okay, well, oh, I like that word. And I do that. I play those little games with myself when I'm in the car, when I hear uh, announces and journalists talking and writing. I'm I'm really a word boy. Take me back to the moment when Wes Farrell recruited you onto the Partridge Family project. Well, it was one he he, he had called a, a meeting with for, for all of us writers, Tony Ronio, Tony Wine. I think that was it. About six, seven of us, and me and Jimmy Craticus. This was a yes, pilot was, episode showing. Yes, it was yeah. uh, the pilot episode showing, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we went over. Was to Lester, Screen Jams. Was Lester Sill there from Screen Yes, he was. Music? Yes, he was there. <laughs> He's the one who did the talking, mostly. It, because there was no music. It was just, well, there they are. And you see them all. You say, well, okay. You know, is it like we, we look at, like, oh, like, you know, well, what's what's this going to be like? I don't know. Kids are kids adorable, you know, you know David Cassidy. And, and, and the little girl that plays the keyboards there, she was adorable too. Shirley Jones needs no introduction. And the other kids were okay, you know? I said, but you know, it's like, you just like a little family. I mean, how's this gonna, I mean, it's not like re real rock. It's, it's gotta be some sort of pop. And, and so Lester Sills, you know, he was no stranger to, I mean, he was Phil Spector's partner, for God's sakes. He was in Philly's records. He was a real guy. When, when Lester starts talking, he said, this will be good for all you writers. You make a lot of money with this stuff. You'll get notoriety out of this stuff. And he was right. We got all that out of that stuff. Okay. Wes did. I did. Tony Wine did. Uh, Erwin Levine, L. Russell Brown, Tony Romeo. Oh, everybody, everybody did well out of that whole thing, man. <clears throat> you know, I can't say anything bad about it. And, and 
what I, I what I knew is when Wes would come in, Wes would say, "Hey, I got this idea." You know, doesn't somebody want to be wanted? I said, okay, I got it, Wes. Boom, boom, boom. That's it. No, I got it. Don't worry about a thing. He said, okay, Mike. Boom. And he disappeared. That would be all he'd ever do on it. We'd do the way we write the whole rest of the song completely. And we'd put his name on it because we knew if we put his name on it, we were bound to get it cut. It's just great. And so some things are just, will never change. And, 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 I, and I love it. Jimmy Iveen says, I don't know. He says, you know, the world's going to, to, to heavy music. We had... Sarah Lord Baltimore already produced, okay? So we already knew what heavy music was all about. <laughs> and, right. You know, and here comes Bruce Springsteen down the road. You know, like, maybe we don't want to, maybe this is going to make us look funny if we're doing this kind of stuff. Maybe we'll, we'll start to lose some credibility. I don't know. But anyway, we started to do some of the songs. And some of the songs, when I listen to them now, are not as kiddy as I thought they were when I was doing them. They're not as kiddie. Like, for instance, I listened to this morning to Rainmaker. And I said, Rainmaker? I said, you know, and, and and some of these other ones, somebody wants to love you and, and I can hear your heartbeat, feel your heartbeat, our umbrella man. I said, well, they have changes. I didn't think we put in those damn songs. Is that, is that fair? I can't believe we did that. And that's why people come up to me in my whole, during my life, keep saying, oh, I love those Partridge Family I always, I, I'm always like a, a little amazed quite frankly, that I got as much notoriety for being a writer on the Partridge Family songs, even though I know the Partridge Family songs I wrote, the Bruce Springsteen songs he wrote. Okay, you know, Born to Run, that's Bruce, not me. No, I've had, I've had people, it depends on who the people are. They're out there by the millions, okay? By the millions, okay? Mm. Sir Lord Baltimore has, no, has, has a little obscure audience today. Now, every now and then when I run into one of them, they're, you know, they're fanatics. They're total crazies. They'll tell me how great the, the, the records are and everything like that. But it, it doesn't matter. We had a massive audience. There are, there are women there, there that if, if I go to, and I tell them who I am, they say, you wrote for David Cassidy. You wrote that song. They'll fall in love. I can't get that no matter how what I do. <laughs> but I can't do it that way. Thank God for David Cassidy's gorgeous face. You know, I mean, he, he, he was as good looking as they come, I don't know any group. Maybe Davy Jones was 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 another kind of good looking face, but I don't think he was as good looking as David Cassidy. David Cassidy's like the best looking kid, you know, from 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 a, a, a teenage idol standpoint. Maybe Rick Nelson. Mm. Rick Nelson had that guitar player always in there. He was a funky guitar player, so he got a little bit more of the the rock audience than D David did. And that, and what what really bothered me about David and us even too, because I think David knew that we were, and Wes, when we left Wes, David knew that we weren't gonna be writing for him anymore. And we left the Wes Farrell, no, no longer wrote songs for him or anything like that, and that was it. I wanted to break down your songwriting techniques with the five songs that you wrote for the Partridge family. We spoke about what? Doesn't Somebody Want to Be Wanted, which was a million- Wes started, well, Wes started it. Wes yeah. started yeah, that. Wes started it. And and the, and you wrote all the lyrics. Yeah, well, I wrote all the lyrics. Yes, I, I'm not particular, so I wrote all the lyrics. And Jimmy was hemming and hawing about getting involved in it and, uh, and, 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 and at that song. I don't know that he wouldn't have gotten involved with all the others, but, you know, he was rather timid. I don't know if he ever uh, really contributed. And so we, we just went with what, Wes, Wes, what music Wes had given us, and that was it, and I wrote the lyrics, and that was the end of it. On that song... Oh. Doesn't somebody want to be wanted? There's a speaking section in the middle, yep. which David always hated having to do. Was it intended to be a speaking part originally when you wrote it? Nope, we never had that. Wes waltzes in with with the, with the, the finished masters of the first album. He comes in, I'm there. It's him and me again. I always was in very very early, okay. And Wes would take the uh, the the uh, red eye flight from Los Angeles. And so he'd be landing at six in the morning all the time. By the time he got, got to the office, it was seven, 7.30. I'd be already there with my coffee. And you know, if, if I knew he was coming, I would have a coffee for him. And so sure enough, he comes into the uh, into the office and he says, oh boy, I got it all here. You got to get a kick out of it. We'll start out with one. And he plays uh, Tony Romeo's, I think I love you first. He says, I think this is going to be the first one. I said, well, it sounds like a good one to me. He says, all right, he says, we got number two. Play this. So play, he plays it for me. And then he then he goes like this. He says, I says, I'm gonna pull your leg now. 
wait, 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 a part's coming up that you're going to love. And it's the talk part with David playing the talk part. And I said, you devil, you put one of those in this record? <laughs> did, did you have any right to do that? <laughs> he says, yeah, I'm Wes Farrell, I'm the producer. <laughs> so we all, we all listen to it after a while. The absurdity of it is that he's not like anyone else, as, as, D- as David's going to find out. He's not like anyone else. Once you go onto that boob tube and you're as good looking as you are, and you saw what happened with the Beatles, didn't you? When they all went on the boob tube, they had the Ed Sullivan show. Huh? Did you see that? what happened there? What do you mean? I'm just like anybody else. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> so Wes got it right. Not that I thought of it, but Wes got it right. And, and I could see how David might think that, you know, that's uh, hearkening back to another era, a doo-wop era, where they like, kind of like talk in the, in the middle of the song. Yeah, but Wes was, Wes was alive during those eras, and he came up during those eras, and he wrote songs from those eras. And you wouldn't be here, and I wouldn't be here if, if it wasn't for Wes. And, of course, it's easy for me to put things in that perspective today because I'm older. I've lived through it all, you know, and uh, so I have uh, – there's always a soft spot for people who were good to you, especially later on. You may, maybe when, you, when it's happening, you, you, you're too young and too brash to know any better. Uh, what's being done for you but you know certainly now I have no excuse and I uh, and I make sure that I give credit where credit is doing yeah. then on 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 the other ones Wes would do similar things he would he would come in with a with a line or something somewhere or a title or I'd have the title he says, oh I like that title you know and and then you know maybe he'd write a line somewhere and then we'd write it all I mean Wes, Wes wrote very little but hey you don't have you don't have that show if it ain't with Wes. You you don't even have a job, Mike, if it ain't with Wes. So all that doesn't happen without Wes. Wes, Wes did maybe 10, 15 percent, 20 percent of, of the, the five songs that we did for the Partridge family. And Jim and I did everything else. And we never, ever regret one second of that. First of all, he was a ball of fire. He, he could get you going. If you were in a, in a depressed state of mind, uh, something, Wes would come in and he would be so on. 10 from one to 10 uh, that you say, okay, 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 all right, all right, look, let, this is what he, this, let's do it, let's get on it. And we get on it, we get into it. And before you know it, we'd have it. And then he, he come in, he says, oh, is, that the, is that my song? I said, yeah, it's your song. Yeah. And I say, oh, I like it. I say, it's coming along. Great, man. Great, good. Keep it up. I think I got some more. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and believe it or not, he would come back and take more songs from us and 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 put and, and we put his name on every single one. We made sure that the lead sheet had his song on it every time. And he was good for me. Here's here's a perfect example. He got Paul Anka to record Midnight Mistress for me and Jim. He got uh, Carolyn Franklin, uh, Aretha Franklin's sister, on RCA also to do uh, Soul Soul Searching. You know that we that we had written. So he got those covers. He, he took those songs of ours and he recorded them with those two artists. So we got those covers without him, no covers. It's like, uh, I have to say to, to David, as much as I feel for him and his d- desperate desire to be playing what he considered, you know, like Pink Floyd kind of type song, you know, real real songs with real meaning and, 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 and not so pop oriented. Because you got to understand, David was at a certain age where he wasn't as old as the guys in Pink Floyd. And he didn't have that kind of background, you know, musicianship background. So he wasn't coming from that. He's going to try to change horses in midstream. That's no easy job. I don't give that for anybody to have to do. The Beatles had to change, you know, to do this or to do that. You know, whoop, 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 whoop. You know, they might have some real trouble or they might get angry and and they might lose time. And who the heck knows? They might, one guy might get fired, get another guy in there and then you don't have the Beatles anymore. So you you, got to be careful when you start messing with a good thing or with maybe the only thing that it can be. You can't just have an album come out and all of a sudden you're like Peter Frampton, you know, like in Humble Pie. What? It's like, what is this? So, you know, the girls, the little girls don't know what's going on and their parents don't know what's going on. And all of a sudden you're doing things that you're going to get fired for. There's a reason why all this had to stay in place. You can't just do this and have it become such a a monetary success 
and such a worldwide success and say, oh, let's, ch- oh, David, he's not feeling it anymore. He, he wants to do more educated lyrics. He wants to be more like, you know, blah, blah, blah. Whoa, how the heck are we ever going to do that? Who's going to be able to do that? I don't know anybody who could do it for him and be successful. And I don't know how after he did it, the girls would not be, they would be up in arms about, you know, where's the songs like you used to, you know, have, blah, 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 blah. You know, because those are the songs they will relate to. They will not relate to uh, Mary Queen of Arkansas. That is not happening with the youngsters. Uh, You know, you have to be careful when you try to change who you are or the perception of who you are from the get-go, you know? Uh, And from the get-go, you were a teen idol, if ever there was one. I mean, you're the best-looking one I ever laid eyes on. (laughs) And I'm just seeing some pretty good ones, pretty good lookers, but you're the best. And I could see why the girls, you know, and thank goodness, I wasn't aware so much <clears throat> the, the, the upbeat, the, the upbeat way he played some of his songs that we wrote for him and the sophisticated way or the, you know, like you could say, the Chicago arrangements that he did on some That's of the songs. Right. <clears throat> so he even, he did the best he could to get there somehow by using our songs in hipper arrangements than the ones that Wes used on the original recordings. 